This is Nick Seifert. Uh, I'm giving this as a uh, practice before um, I'll be presenting this uh, to the class I'm teaching in the Fall uh, Energy Systems Modern course. And this is part of the, some of the motivational slides for that course, which I'm teaching uh, the fall of 2015 semester. And this is just a practice which I'm uh, hoping to put up onto YouTube. So the talk is in Introduction to Global Warming. Um, and why that global warming is coming from the uh, human emission of CO2s from the burning of fossil fuels. So I just want to give a little bit of background. A lot of things can affect global average climates. Um, solar output certainly is going to be one of those. right? And uh, solar output does change on an 11-year cycle due to the outp changing output of uh, sunspots. But as we'll see in the next uh, slide, it's only about a 0.1 percent effect on uh, the Earth's set. Um, it's only changing by about 0.1 percent. Other things could be if there was change in the reflectivity of the ground. Um, ice can reflect more sunlight than grass, right? So if if the actual Earth were changing from ice to grass, that certainly would be affecting global uh, average climate. Uh, other things that can affect global average climate are the emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere or the emission of particulates or aerosols such as when a volcano erupts. Uh, other, um, there's pure out, there can be, um, some of these are periodic like the solar output. There, there can be ones that are slightly periodic but definitely fluctuating such as changes in the El Nino and La Nina. Um, and um, there are some very periodic oscillations over the long time period, these are oscillations in the Earth's axis on the order of about uh, 41,000 years, and the um, oscillations in the precision, uh, precession of the Earth's orbit, which happen on the order of 21,000 year cycle. These last ones we'll, we'll talk about in a couple slides, and those are the ones that leads to the cycles of the ice ages and then the thawing afterwards. So let's first talk about solar output. Right? Solar output can also has recently been changing with a 11 year cycle and um, the solar output has varied about by less than 0.1 percent over the last 40 years. It works out that um, net solar irradiance can go about up or down by about 0.5 watts per meter squared. Um, and one thing to note here is that between 2002 and 2010, there was a decrease of just over about one watt per meter squared. Right. Um, the other thing to note here is that that's the solar irradiance, um, which then needs to be divided by four multiplied by 0 0.7 to convert it into equivalent forcing that would happen from a greenhouse gas. So what we can say here is between 2002 and 2010, there was a net decreasing radiative forcing of 0 0.3 watts per meter squared. Not a large number, as we'll see when we uh, look at other numbers, but it's still something we, that should be taken account of because that, that decrease of 0 0.3 watts per meter squared turns into about a roughly a decrease in global temperatures by 0 0.24 Kelvin, uh, or 0 0.24 Celsius. Uh, the main thing to point out here is that these oscillations cannot explain why temperatures have been increasing since 1880, uh, and in particular cannot explain the increase since 1980, um, where temperatures have been increasing significantly since 1980, whereas if you would have solar output has remained com basically completely flat since 1980. The other reason, so what I'm trying to explain here is that um, the change in the solar output is not the cause of the increase in temperatures we've seen since um, over the, let's say, the last 100 or 50 or even 40 years. So um, if it had been the sun, then we would have seen that there would have been a greater increase in the day temperature than there have been at night. And that's actually not what we're finding. Nights are ever so slightly um, warming more than days are. 
So this is one uh, of the many, as I'll show here, but this is one of the many reasons why we know it's not the output of the sun that's causing um, what we call global warming, which is the increase in temperatures over the last 100 or 50 years. Okay. The other thing to point out is that um, there are natural uh, um, causes to climate change over the hundreds of thousands to millions of years time frame, and those are well known. Uh, these oscillations are named after the Serbian geophysicist and astronomer Milutin Milenkovic. Um, and here he looked at when you include all those uh, oscillations, you can actually um, find a change in the radiance and watch per meter squared that would be uh, arriving either on the north or southern poles. So let's look a little bit more in detail. Uh, here's a graph that goes back 600,000 years. And what's being plotted here in the, the black curve that winds around here, if we start, this is today. And if we go back in time, this is the amount of sunlight hitting the North Pole. And then this dashed blue line is the amount of sunlight hitting the Southern um, South Pole. So what we can see here is that in the very, very recent time frame, the amount of sunlight hitting the Southern uh, South Pole is actually decreasing. At the Northern, um, at the North Pole, we have, we're sitting at a kind of, we're just coming out of the bottom of a local minimum. So it's ever so slightly increasing, but um, really not much has changed all that drastically. Um, I do want to point out here though, if we go back, there was a time, pe there was a time period here in the, we we're talking about 10,000 year time frame where both the temperature in the North Pole and South Pole are increasing. And this is what really got us out of the last ice age, which would have been uh, this time period here, in which there was both of them are going in the same direction of a decrease in temperature. Then you can see we're getting out of the ice ages, but now in the re very recent time period, um, there is no reason uh, right now, the net effect is that temperatures should be decreasing. Um, um, so, the main point is natural variation through the Milankovitch cycles cannot explain global warming. In fact, it would, you know, I mean, these are all, you know, we're talking about tens to tens of thousands of years, right? So, obviously, nothing happening at the 10 year to 100 year time frame would even show up on these, really. But the main, I'm just kind of pointing this out that if um, natural variation would actually be predicting ever so slightly decreases. Uh, in global temperatures. So we can once again rule out natural variation. We can rule out the sun, we can rule out natural variation. Um, so let's talk a little bit about those natural variations. So um, it doesn't take much of the change in the tilt of the earth to have um, a major effect on temperatures and on uh, CO2 concentrations because there's feedbacks. right? Uh, as the if the temperature decreases a little bit, what happens is more CO2 can get absorbed in the ocean. Um, more ice can form. So you have if more CO2 is absorbed in the ocean, you have less in the atmosphere, so you have less global warming happening. Uh, if you have more ice forming, you have more reflection of sunlight. And these are both feedbacks um, so such that it doesn't take that much of a change in the tilt of the earth, to cause some major temperature uh, changes, which also show up as changes in CO2 concentration. But over the last 400 years, the temperature, the concentration of CO2 has not really gone above, has not gone above 300 parts per million, whereas now it's up in the 400 range. So we're we're mo we're well outside the range of what we've seen in the last 400,000 years, and that is something to be concerned about. Now the numbers that you know we're at 400 parts per million. That number is not particularly large when you look at the millions. If you go back hundreds of millions of years, um, but when we go back that far, changes in CO2 concentration, life can adapt if you have millions of years, right? The issue here is that 
were changing their the concentration of CO2 at the you know in the time frame of centuries, and um, life cannot just adapt over the century time period. Um, species cannot just adapt in the you know hundred time year time frame. Um, let alone people who have built houses in flood zones can't um, can't just easily adapt once they build a house. Right. You know, we're very, very quickly putting the CO2 up into the atmosphere. Um, but the other reason I did put this up here is just to point out that you know, life can survive at higher concentrations. It's not like CO2 is a um, toxic pollutant in the sense that once you hit a certain concentration, you start dying. Like if, there, if you had that much um, hydrogen sulfide or carbon monoxide, you know, CO2, it's, it's a greenhouse gas, which means it's affecting emission of radiation um, so it's a, it's an indirect one and, and of course that's the the tough thing about it is there's it's not like a direct effect like you walk into a room with high hydrogen sulfide and you know you could just die right co2 its effects are indirect either from higher temperatures or even higher um, higher acidity in the oceans okay so let's let's go into um, a little bit about how do we know that the CO2 is coming from anthropogenic sources? So we know there's a CO2 in increase in CO2 concentrations. Here, um, here's some data between 1960 and 2010. Um, I've shown up on the right if we I included the data point for 2014, which is the CO2 concentrations are now just um, are reaching 400 parts per million. And you see this increase in the CO2. At the same time, there's an equal amount of decrease in, in oxygen. So we know that the CO2 is coming from the burning of, of something carbon-based. That's what we can show from here. We know it's coming from something carbon-based. Um, so we know it's not coming from it's not just being emitted from volcanoes. Because if it was being emitted from volcanoes, we wouldn't also be seeing the equal amount of oxygen decrease. Okay. The other thing is we know that it's coming from fossil fuels based off of the change in the, we're actually seeing a decrease in the ratio of carbon 13 to 12, carbon 12, which is exactly what would be predicted if this was coming from the burning of fossil fuels. So the, this decrease uh, trends with the increase in CO2 that we are emitting into the atmosphere. Um, so this, this combined with the decrease in oxygen, as I showed on the last slide, is the smoking gun that the increase of CO2 is due to the burning of fossil fuels. Okay, so the next thing is let's talk a little about what it means to be a greenhouse gas. So in order for something a uh, gas to be labeled a greenhouse gas, it needs to have an asymmetric vibrational mode. It needs to, when it vibrates, it needs to have a create a net dipole. Okay, so the noble gases, argon, neon, helium, and krypton, are monotonic. They don't have vibrational modes, and hence you can't have a dipole form. So noble gases are not greenhouse gases. Um, the other thing to note here is when nitrogen and oxygen vibrate, they vibrate symmetrically. They just go back and forth, like a uh, kind of a slinky that's just going back and forth. And uh, because of that, there is no net dipole, and hence um, oxygen and uh, nitrogen cannot couple to the electric, um, elec to a photon, in order to absorb in the IR. Okay, so that leaves us with those gases that can couple to uh, infrared radiation, and that's water, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, nit dinitrogen oxide, and ozone. Um, and the important thing here to note is with carbon dioxide, um, it has three vibrational modes. I'll talk a little bit about this, but two of the modes are where the carbon actually pops out. And that's the asymmetric vibrational mode, because you actually then have a net dipole. Um, it, CO2 will have a symmetric stretch, and that one will not absorb in the IR. But the 
asymmetric ones in which pop, the carbon actually pops out and you have a net angle, you have some angles, so it looks almost like water, you know, has a permanent angle to it. Those ones can absorb in the IR. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about it. So water vapor um, is, is extremely active. It has an existing dipole and then has also all of its motor modes are asymmetric. So water vapor, not only is there a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere, but it can absorb. Um, the one thing to note about water vapor is that we're not concerned about water vapor emissions from power plants, because when you burn the same methane, um, you're emitting carbon dioxide and water vapor. We're not concerned about the water vapor that's being emitted, because the lifetime of water is only on the order of a few weeks in the atmosphere. It just doesn't stay up there that long. It comes back down as rain. Whereas CO2 can have a lifetime in the atmosphere of between 100 to 300 years. And it has two asymmetric vibrational modes that can absorb in the IRR, each of which have one degree of freedom. So CO2 is, is one of the ones we're worried about. It's particularly stable in the atmosphere It's um, because it can't be oxidized anymore. Uh, methane has two asymmetric vibrational modes each of which are triply degenerate. So it's really like there's six modes that are active. Um, methane also is not saturated in the atmosphere, um, but uh, I guess we should say it. Luckily, it doesn't have a particularly long lifetime in the atmosphere, only on the order of about 12 years. Because it can be oxidized and turned into carbon dioxide um, and water vapor, um, its lifetime in the atmosphere is less than CO2. So what we'll say here is the greenhouse effect, effect is the process of absorption and then re-emission of the Earth's IR radiation by gases in the atmosphere, resulting in a lower a warming of the lower atmosphere in the surface because we effectively are adding a blanket. In a couple slides, we'll go into really we'll go into the details of what we mean by that. Uh, but before then, I just kind of want to point out that um, you can calculate something called the hundred year or you could calculate the 20 year or 100 but here I'm, I'm giving you the hundred year global warming potential which means that if you were to integrate over a hundred years um, the amount of warming you would obtain for a gas and then you divided that amount of warming by the warming you'd get by putting out one molecule of co2 you get a ratio and that these are the ratios here so for methane it's the hundred year global warming potential is 25 which means that it takes, it would take 25 molecules of CO2 to have the same global warming potential as one molecule of methane if you integrated it over 100 years. For, uh, for NOx, it would be 300. And for um, a fluorocarbon such as CFC12, that number is actually on the order of 10,000, which means you need 10,000 molecules of carbon dioxide for every molecule of CFC 12. So the, here, the thing to point out here is that carb, uh, fluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons um, can have significant effects um, even when there aren't that many of them just because their global warming potentials are so large. Okay, so the next thing what we're gonna, we're gonna s spend a couple of slides looking at um, radiation as a function of the wavelength. And we're just going to walk through what's happening uh, here uh, on average on the Earth. So what are shown here is the downward going solar radiation from the Sun and then the upward radiation of from the Earth. So the Sun is uh, radiating at about um, five and a half to six thousand Kelvin. Um, but by the time it, you don't, we don't see a nice pl uh, Planckian distribution when we're sitting down uh, at the surface of the Earth. Um, in the UV, there's a couple of reasons why there's not a significant amount. Of, uh, there's not a significant amount of UV hitting the surface. Now that's due to first Rayleigh scattering, and second due to the absorption of UV by oxygen in the forming of ozone. Um, also, when you go in down into the visible and um, short wavelength infrared, 
you can have some water vapor emission, which are all these little uh, cuts into the absorption curve here. What you can see is the UV is being cut largely here, and you have a um, most of what gets through is then indivisible. And that gets then goes to the uh, surface. This goes to the surface of the Earth, warms um, is warming up the Earth, and then gets re-rated in the infrared. And you can see what actually gets emitted looks nothing like a Planckian distribution at a given temperature. It looks nothing like that. Um, huge, huge chunks are taken out. So this is these are distribution Planckian distributions for what. If you had a black body radiation at uh, 310 Kelvin, 260 Kelvin, and uh, 310, 260, and 210 Kelvin, and um, but then normalized so that they all had the same uh, net amount of power, right? Um, these are all being normalized, which is why their peak heights are the same. Um, it's just to give you a feel for what the shapes would look like. Um, so there's large chunks being taken out. That's due uh, largely due to water vapor. Water vapor is taking a huge chunk out here, and it's also taking a large chunk out here. We've got carbon dioxide taking out a large chunk. Um, we've got methane taking a chunk out over here. And right smack dab in the middle of this curve, we've got ozone taking out a chunk. Okay. So... In some sense, it's good that there's green, some greenhouse gases, right? The Earth would have a temperature, average temperature about negative 18 degrees Celsius, right? So it's not, it's good to keep in mind, you know, we're not talking about, these aren't pollutions and uh, pollutants in the typical sense, like, you know, there's virtually no, I mean, you don't want to be walking into a room with hydrogen sulfide. So we can call hydrogen sulfide a pollutant. Um, it's a toxic pollutant, right? Greenhouse gases, we have to be somewhat, somewhat thankful for them. I mean, we're th very thankful for them. The problem is when you build an entire society and civilization based around a certain level, if you very quickly double the concentration of CO2s, that's the problem. Because if we've been living at 15, let's say, Celsius, and that jumps up to 17 or 18 degrees Celsius in a rapid amount of time, it can cause massive problems. So let's, um, let's look a little bit more about the uh, IR absorption. Uh, there have been some studies done um, by satellites. Um, you can look at the change in the amount of power leaving at any frequency. And uh, this upper graph, this graph in the upper left, shows the change in the IR power spectrum between 1970 and 1966. And what you can see here is that the decreases in, in power are exactly lining up with known gases. So this is carbon dioxide, methane, and smaller amounts due to um, CFCs. So when you look over time, you can see that adding CO2 in the atmosphere is actually taking a chunk out of the energy that could, in this case, you know, sunlight's the IR is trying to get out at, let's say, 700, um, at a wave number of 700 per centimeter. Um, but as you add more, in CO2, more CO2, it's harder for it to get out, and you radiate less at that uh, wavelength or wave number. So um, this is also showing, once again, people looked between 2003 and 2012, and you can see large chunk taken out due to the increase of CO2 during that time period, as well as uh, increase in methane during that time period. Okay, so now on this part, I encourage you, if you have a second monitor or after the fact, go to the uh, website link down below for this ModTran uh, software. I would just want to walk you through how you can um, quickly calculate what um, if there were no feedbacks, we're going to do here a case which there's no feedbacks. You know, like I said, um, there's tons of feedbacks out there. Formation of ice, cloud effects, um, um, or increased temperatures, uh, changing the amount of CO2 that can be absorbed in the ocean. Right? There's there's a lot of feedbacks, um, and those you know obviously very quickly I would have to take hours upon hours to to look at every single feedback. 
I just want to kind of go over kind of the physical basis for this. So what what I'm showing, uh, what this is the output from the software, which you just go to the their, their website, and they allow you to change um, concentration of CO2, concentration of methane, concentrations of ozone, and also um, uh, water vapor. They also allow you to change the temperature at the ground. So the base case is 290, uh, 294 Kelvin, but you can change that number. You can also change your location. Here, everything I'll be doing will be mid-altitude, uh, mid so let's say North American summers, which it is right now, so uh, with no cloud or rain. You can change that as well. So um, what, the, what um, the output is, um, you can see a bunch of these planking distributions at different temperatures, and here they're not being normalized. Uh, as you know, planking and uh, the amount of power power um, goes like the temperature to the fourth. So each of these light light blue, purple, green, yellow, and red curves are the amount of power that would be radiated at a given free, uh, wave number uh, as a function of the temperature of the ground or of the atmosphere. Um, and so you can see less power. This is the planking curve for 220 Kelvin, and this is the red curve is 200 uh, is 300 Kelvin. Okay. Now on the right here, thing I want to point out before I go back in to look at this blue squiggly line is to point out this blue curve here shows you the temperature of the atmosphere. And uh, the key thing to note here is that the temperature of the atmosphere is decreasing as you go up in altitude. And uh, the other thing that's happening is the concentration of CO2 is decreasing such that um, eventually you get to the point up here where there's virtually no carbon dioxide left. So what I want to go over here is that the ground may be at 290 Kelvin, right? So we would have a planking distribution around 290. And you can see that there are regions here that follow a 290 curve between where CO2 and ozone emit and then absorb and where between where ozone and methane and water start absorbing. Right? So that's that's radiation that is being emitted from the ground and can just leave. Whereas when you're at the 700 wave number, what's happening is the CO2 it is absorbing and then re-emitting, absorbing, re-emitting, absorbing, re-emitting until you get to that last point in time in which there's no more CO2 absorbing. But by the time you get up to this at part of the atmosphere, the temperature is only maybe on the order of 230 Kelvin, which means that a lot less power can be radiated at 230 Kelvin than it can at 300 Kelvin. So the net effect here of CO2 is that you are decreasing the amount of sunlight uh, of, of IR sorry decreasing the amount of IR that can leave at any given wavelength and so it really w the the reason for this is that the temperature of the atmosphere is decreasing over the range in which these gases actually kind of um, exist so um, so a large part of the you know the reason why we have increasing the CO2 is going to increase global te temperatures is that it's forcing re-radiation at higher temperatures um, uh, sorry at higher altitudes which means lower temperatures which means less actual radiation so what we're find what we'll find out as we walk through this is we're gonna need to have the ground increase in t temperature to compensate for that so let's let's walk through that um, over the next couple slides one thing I want to point out in this next slide is I, re, re, I run the simulation both in the case with and without water. With water is red squiggly lines and uh, without water is this dark blue. And I just wanted to show you here um, the difference between the blue and the red is, is, where wa is due to water. And uh, it's important to point out here that it's now easier to see the effect that methane is having um, in this around 13 to 1400 wave number it's um you can see it's not saturated um, in the same way like co2 is saturated right at about 700 wave numbers
um, which is part of the reason why its global warming potential is higher um, than CO2. The other reason was, of course, that there's a lot more absorption lo lo uh, bands. Okay, so that's here you can see water's taking a slight chunk out, but it's not completely uh, saturated. Okay. So let's walk through what, what would happen if, um, so back in the say 1880 concentrations of CO2 were 280 p parts per million. What would happen if we got to 800 parts per million of CO2? So that's the blue curve, the red being the baseline back in 1980 when, sorry, back in 1880 when there were about 280 parts per million of CO2. Um, so you can see that there's an ever so slight change and, uh, and, and, and decrease in the amount of IR being emitted at the ends of these curves um, around the CO2. And the net, if you go down here at the bottom, what the software will calculate is the net IR flux leaving compared to how much is coming in. So 282 is um, how much would have been leaving uh, in your baseline case. So in the red model, you have 282 watts per meter squared. In the blue model, you have 278. The difference is 4.4 watts per meter squared. That's pretty big because if you remember, I was talking about the oscillations through the sun cycle having an effect of 0.3 watts per meter squared. Right. We're talking about an over an, an order of magnitude larger effect if you were to triple this concentration of CO2 from its its prior baseline model. Right? Which means that you can start having a significant ef effect on the outgoing IR radiation. So that's what happens you can see there's a forcing function of about 4.4 watts per meter Kelvin. Now, what we're going to do next is I go, I'm going to go in and change the temperature of the ground offset by 1.89 Celsius, and uh, keeping the CO2 concentrations at 800. And what you can see here is, compared to the base case, now the new model has 282 watts per meter squared, and um, so your ground temperature has gone up by almost 2 degrees Celsius, um, and that's how you're compensating for it. So basically, as you can see, you can see the blue here, right? So the overall temperature has increased, so there's more power leaving here and here, and there's ever so slight power, uh, slightly less power leaving here and here. So if we were just to roughly triple CO2, you can see that'd be causing about a two degrees Celsius increase in temperatures if you ignore feedbacks uh, and there are there are plenty of feedbacks so um, I'm not advocating that we let CO2 emissions go up to 800 parts per million I'm just trying to point out it, it, it you if there were no forcing functions roughly 800 parts per million is, is where we're going to get to um, what you need to for a two degree rise in Celsius uh, two degrees Celsius rise in temperatures but there are feedbacks I'm not going to go through those, but those lower can lower that down to the order of that's, you know, of 600 parts per million, on that kind of order of magnitude, um, in order to get a two degree Celsius rise in temperatures. Okay, the next thing I want to point out here is that we can um, see the effects of CO2 emissions in temperatures. So what I want to point out here is to do so, though, we need to include all the different effects. So here is a uh, study that was done, uh, you link to down here at the bottom. When you include oscillations um, in, the, in weather, when you include um, the emission of aerosols from volcanoes, this light blue, and when you include the ever so slight changes due to in solar radiation, and then add on to that the amount of temperature that you should be getting due to anthropogenic emission of CO2 and methane. When you add all those together, you get this orange model here. Right. And then you can compare that to actual global surface temperatures. And what do you see? You see a very, very good 
but not exact. Very good match and high correlation between these two, which means that we, when you when you include all these effects, we can do a, a very good job of predicting or postdicting uh, temperatures. Right, and what we can see here is that. Yes, there will be oscillations. You know, predicting is going to be tough because you never know when there's going to be the next volcano. You actually don't know if the solar cycle is going to do what it, it's been doing in the past, and you certainly have almost no control of being able to predict the uh, El Nino and Southern oscillations. However, the nice thing is, if you can average over all of these things, the trend should be in the upward direction. So that same paper. He also tried to do some predictions, and you can see that, um, of course, we don't know at the time that they wrote the paper in 2009, they didn't know what the solar cycle, solar cycle was a little bit different than their actual predictions, um, didn't go quite up as, uh, as high as I think they had predicted, um, and I think it took it an extra year for it to kick in, and um, certainly uh, weren't able to predict volcanoes very well or anything like that. But the, the main thing I want to point out here is that you know, we have been seeing increases in temperatures, right? We can still see this linear trend due to the anthropogenic influence, right? 2004 was the highest temperature on record. This is uh, NOAA data for both the uh, land and ocean, com that combined temperature. Uh, each of these are the, the yearly data. 2004 here in this last dot was the highest temperature ever on record. And as, a, as I'm speaking, in September, it looks like 2015 is now going to be even hotter than 2014. So we're gonna s we, we are seeing these trends of increased temperatures that are being predicted in models. So now I'd, I'd like to just conclude what I went over uh, in this presentation. So we know that CO2 concentrations are increasing due to the combustion of fossil fuels. The evidence for that was the increasing CO2 concentration, decreasing CO oh, oxygen concentration, and we saw a decreasing uh, ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12, which are all predicted from the combustion of fossil fuels being the source of the CO2. And the other conclusion is that these increased concentrations of CO2 are causing increases in the global average temperature. So there was two, two mains that line for this evidence. The first is we know CO2 can cause a decrease in the transmission in the IR spectra at a, wa um, at a wave number of around 700 per centimeter. It does not significantly overlap with other gas species. So that when you add more CO2 in the atmosphere, you get less IR um, power at that wavelength, which means overall the Earth has to warm up so that in the other wavelengths, it can get more power to compensate for the loss of power at 700 wave number. Okay, so that's the first. We know it can affect temperatures. And two, we actually see increases in temperature. Um, a linear trend when you accurately account for solar cycles, volcanic input, and um, weather events like El Nino's, not La Nina's, southern oscillations. When you include all of those, what you're left over with it is, is that linear trend, which means that models can fairly predict um, global average temperatures when you average over all of those solar cycle volcanic inputs and, and weather events. You're going to be left with this linear trend unless we actually stop the emission of CO2 into the atmosphere and you know and actually cause it to stop um, going over a concentration, let's say, of 600 parts per million. So those are the conclusions. I just want to go through and kind of go through the physical basis um, for why we know that it's human emission, uh, human burning, uh, humans burning fossil fuels that are the cause of increases in temperature. Thank you for listening.